So uh, friends and family out there who know me well know that I'm a chronic uh, name dropper. And uh, one of the names that I drop frequently um, is Russ Baker. Um, and um, that's unusual for an investigative reporter to drop another investigative reporter's name. We're a pretty competitive lot. It's even more unusual for an old investigative reporter to drop a younger investigative reporter's name. Um, but Russ is, is definitely one of my heroes um, in the trade. He's, um, he's just, uh, I mean, I could stay, st stand here all night and describe the work he's done um, and, um, and impress you greatly with it. I'm going to let him uh, talk more about his work than I will. But um, some of the things that have stayed in my mind, you may, some of you may remember Judith Miller, who was a, um, uh, an ace star reporter for the New York Times for a long time. Um, not very well liked inside the Times, but she did uh, do some uh, remarkable work and then uh, kind of burned all her bridges at once by um, insisting that we go to war with Iraq or um, using the same specious arguments that the administration was using um, to excuse it. And uh, Russ um, probably led the way. There were other reporters who were onto the story, but Russ really did the best work um, exposing her um, and um, um, her really, really shoddy reporting um, on the Iraq situation. And um, she's no longer at the Times. Russ maybe can tell you where she is now. She's been moving around quite a bit since then. Um, he's also done um, a lot of uh, uh, work on, well, he did, he did a really, really good story about the vicious uh, media campaign that was um, you, attempting to destroy Kofi Annan when he was the G UN chief. Um, he, um, he exposed the fact that in 1999, um, George W. Bush was openly talking, not so openly, or we'd have all known about it, but Russ found out he was talking about invading Iraq and wanting to invade Iraq in 1990, as early as 1999, a long time before 2001. Um, he also, of course, exposed the real reason why uh, G George W. Bush was grounded uh, during his National Guard service. And um, I consider that a hilarious story, um, which Russ dug up. Um, he also exposed and described the West's um, lack of resolve in, um, persua in the uh, pursuing of uh, Radovan Karavich, Karavich, who probably would have been um, um, caught a lot earlier had it not been for that lack of resolve. Um, he has savage Scientology, which is deserves savaging, I think, in most of our estimation, and um, police union corruption, done some great work in that, um, and the deceptive practices of credit card, um, the credit card industry. Um, he's written for the New Yorker, Vanity Fair, The Nation, New York Times, Washington Post, The Village Voice, and Esquire, and was a contributing editor of the Columbia Journalism Review, um, which we all read in the trade very carefully. Um, his book, which is in the back um, and is available, uh, A Fam Family of Secrets, is uh, the best account uh, that I've seen. And I haven't read them all, I have to admit, but the best of what I've read of the Bush dynasty. And um, I remember actually going into a Black Orc bookstore in, in Berkeley, which had a table about 10 by 10 that had nothing on it right inside the door, nothing on it but Bush books, right? And I looked at all of those books, and there was Russ's there in the book, and, I, and I'd already read it, and I said, the rest of them, throw them out. I mean, this, this, is, this is the one. And, um, and I think if you buy it and read it, you'll agree with me. It is a, just an astounding book. Um, and Russ is also the founder of a wonderful website uh, called Who, What, Why, which is the questions we all ask ourselves as journalists and, and apply our work. And um, he'll tell you more about that tonight. So uh, enough said. Russ, it's yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to... Is that okay? I'm, I'm a little bit hoarse. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, great. 
Well, thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Mark is one of the heroes of mine. He was, uh, I don't know if you were the first, but he was one of the most important editors of Mother Jones magazine. Uh, he's been involved with the Center for Investigative Reporting and many of the uh, most most important institutions of journalism for quite a few years. Are you sure you can hear me okay? Okay, all right. <clears throat> um, I'd like to also thank uh, Elizabeth Barnett in the West Marin Commons, um, Point Reyes Books, uh, and the Point Reyes Presbyterian Church. And I'd also like to just acknowledge my friends uh, Mary Jean and Josh Rowe. Um, uh, John Rowe was a very, very dear friend of mine. He was an important figure in much of the work that I did over the years. Nobody knew that because that was John's nature. Uh, he was uh, modest to a fault, um, and I could never get him uh, to take credit for practically anything. Um, and, and, and I miss him deeply, but we are continuing the work at whowhatwhy.com that he was part of. Uh, he was anxious for it to grow and really take off, and uh, it, it, it finally is. And, and, and I think we've, we've taken some resolve in the last few months to really make sure that that happens. And I think he would have been very, very pleased. Um, we are about asking those questions, who, what, and why. Uh, and we especially like the why question. People always say, how are things over at who, what, where? And I say, no, 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 not where, why? <laughs> Don't you understand why? That's the question. That's what we're not asking. We, we kind of know where in a lot, most cases. Uh, but we really want to know why. And we want to know why all these things are going on. So let's just think about a few things that are going on that we're perplexed about. Uh, all of those people who... Um, uh, had hope in Barack Obama and are sort of whatever the feeling is, perplexed, baffled, bemused, frustrated, disappointed, angry uh, at him not uh, necessarily uh, becoming who people thought he might be as president. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got this carnival of crazies. Uh, have you ever seen, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the various presidential lineups over the years, I mean, it would be, you know, Wilkie versus Dewey. I mean, these people are, are those who were more sober citizens than the most sober of the GOP citizens this time around. Uh, and it's a kind of a crazy situation. And then we have the Koch brothers and the Tea Party and Rupert Murdoch. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. It would make a great sort of funny novel, except if it weren't true. Um, and then we have all of these things going on all over the world that don't make any sense at all. Uh, NATO bombing the heck out of Libya for humanitarian reasons. And of course, now we find out uh, after the fact when nobody's paying attention anymore that Gaddafi didn't really kill very many people. It was a, it was a very, very small number. Um, but the bombings, I think we will find, killed many, many more, the humanitarian bombings. Uh, we have uh, people occupying Wall Street right now, uh, something that is not being very well covered by the media. That was much more interested when people occupied a square in Cairo. Uh, not so interested in what's going on at home. Um, and, uh, of course, we have the fact that we're all worried and afraid all the time now, or we're told we should be. That doesn't seem like a very healthy state of affairs um, and then uh, it, when you look at, uh, again, back at Obama at the top and the lack of change there, and you see that uh, many of the people he brought in to advise him on the economy are the same people who created derivatives in the first place. They also have a stake because they'll be going right back into those same firms. They have a stake in not, not uh, causing too many problems for those firms. Uh, and then he, of course, uh, for his defense secretary, he kept Robert Gates, who was the Bush defense secretary. There's, there's nothing in the Constitution that I know of that requires you to keep on the, the uh, Secretary of Defense from the opposite party. Um, so there's, there's so many non-changes at the top at the same time that there are so many changes in the world. So we have a tremendous amount of change, and then we have no change. And I'm very interested in that dichotomy. Uh, and just a, a hint of some of the things that indicate there may be something wrong. I don't know if you saw the newspaper today, but um, a lawsuit uh, that was filed uh, uh, against the Obama administration wanting the pictures of uh, the body of Osama bin Laden. They wanted proof that, in fact, he was killed in that raid. And I understand why there have been so many lies out there over the years that people are skeptical of almost everything. Uh, and they, the uh, Obama administration says they won't turn them over because they're afraid it will expose American troops to violence. Uh, you can make what you will of that. 
Uh, then there uh, is their torture policy, which is the same or even uh, more uh, aggressive than that of, of Bush. Um, uh, they won't uh, declassify, you may have heard, parts of the 9-11 report. There were 38 pages of the report uh, that Bush said could not be released. We believe those are about Saudi Arabia. I'll talk a little bit about some reporting we've been doing at Who, What, Why on Saudi Arabia and 9-11. Uh, but uh, uh, I was told by one of the... Uh, parents of someone who died uh, at the World Trade Center, that he was told personally by Obama that he would declassify it, but he has changed his mind. Uh, how do we explain all of these things? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, Family of Secrets, because it is a book that just doesn't seem to go uh, out of style. For some reason, every time everybody thinks, well, the bushes are done and we don't need to know any more about them, something crops up that can only be explained by going back and looking at those things that we never understood in the first place. I got into reporting uh, that turned into Family of Secrets uh, in 2004. Uh, I'd been living in the former Yugoslavia for a year and a half, training journalists there in investigative reporting during the run-up to the Gulf War. I could see that this uh, whole situation was a setup, was, a, was being cooked, and I wrote about it from uh, Belgrade and was surprised that more people weren't writing about it from the United States. But as I traveled around Europe once the war started, I found tremendous animosity toward me as an American, and people were genuinely furious uh, and I had to explain that at least half of the people in, in our country did not support those kinds of policies, just as many people in Serbia didn't necessarily support what Milosevic and some of the others did there. Uh, but I realized when I came back in 2004 that I had a job to do. I had a responsibility in this country uh, as a journalist to not just kind of sit back and find uh, the subjects we all like, you know, the sort of profiles of a woodsman or something like that, which we all enjoy doing, and really kind of get in on the biggest stories of our time. And to me, one of the biggest stories of our time was, what in the world were we doing with George W. Bush as the president of the United States? This really baffled me, and uh, one of the things I like to do with our work at whowhatwhy.com, and we're trying to bring in and train a new generation of journalists, and I always say to them, go with your gut. You know, ask the kind of questions that only kids seem able to ask, those really basic questions. You know, this guy just does not seem, never did seem like presidential material. He certainly didn't seem like somebody that most people, even those who knew him, would have really wanted to be the most powerful person in the world. And so how had that happened and what did it mean? And I began traveling around the United States asking people, and I got all kinds of different flip answers. Everybody thought this was not worthy of actually delving into. And I said, no, no, I don't, I don't mean this in an existential sense. I really, really want to know because he raised enormous amounts of money from some of the smartest, toughest people in this country, and they knew who he was. What, what were they thinking? And, and I wanted to know. And so I began traveling around the country, speaking to people who knew him, people who had w done research on him and so forth, trying to come up with something. And I, uh, Basically, I began reporting on um, this military service record that Mark Dowie mentioned uh, because I was so fascinated by that. Here he was. We already knew that, that the, the Casas Belli in Iraq, the weapons of mass destruction, did not exist. Uh, and we knew that he had wanted to push us into war there, and yet here he was on his way to re-election. This just baffled me. Uh, why, was the, the, why was the media not up in arms and just saying, you know, wait a minute, let's talk about this. How, how can this be? Uh, but, but they really weren't. And then I thought, well, okay, here's this John Kerry running against Bush. We, we know there are indications that Bush disappeared from his own military service during a prior conflict. Uh, and here's John Kerry. Well, he's a Democrat, and he's a war hero. He actually not only didn't do what Bush did, which was to avoid going to Vietnam by serving in the National Guard in Texas, uh, Kerry not only went to uh, Vietnam, but he was in one of the most dangerous situations you could be in there. It was absolutely perilous. Uh, and then began this thing with the Swift Boat veterans, where they began questioning his service record. And I thought, this is interesting. There's more interest in questioning Kerry's service record than questioning Bush's service record when Bush is the one who would be the real hypocrite here. And so this bothered me, and I thought, I I'm going to look a little bit into this. And as, John as Mark pointed out, I did dig in, and I did find additional corroborative evidence that he did disappear from the military two years before. This is a felony. It's punishable by a jail sentence. There is no statute of limitations on it, and this has never been looked into or resolved. 
Uh, and he's out there right now on the circuit uh, at these uh, conferences on um, self-help. They, they, have these, they take over big uh, stadiums and the people pay 25 or 50 or $100 to come and hear from George Bush how to be a better person. So I thought, well, you know, I'm poking around here and I'm finding these things. And I was thinking at some point I, I became interested in his father. And I became interested in his father for a couple of reasons. First of all, his father was already a, a, a big politician when the son was supposed to be serving in the military and wasn't. And I thought the, the father must be aware that his son is not showing up, is not going to these bases. I wonder what the father thinks. And I began to find indications of what seemed to me uh, a pattern of the father perhaps helping obscure what his son had done, uh, papering over it. And, and this is what I think was, uh, it was a paper trail that, that appears to have been uh, uh, falsified at the highest levels. So I thought, who can falsify records at the highest levels? You have to be really well connected to do that. And I began looking more at the father, also because uh, if George Bush Sr. had not been president of the United States, who really believes that George Bush Jr., same last name, first, same first name, much less accomplished, could have been president of the United States or even governor of Texas? So I thought, I, you know, I, I'm interested in how George W. Bush became president and why, but now that I think of it, how and why did George H. W. Bush become president? And I started asking people that, and nobody had a good answer for me. They were like, oh, I don't know. He was vice president, and he was CIA director before then. I said, well, why, why was he any of those things? He always seemed to be a kind of a, you know, this kind of harmless character, but not a, you remember he threw up on the Japanese prime minister, and he, he said he, had, he couldn't ha didn't have any good ideas. He had trouble with that vision thing that was not his specialty. And so really not himself the, the most... Uh, uh, the most august of, of figures. And so I began thinking about him, and I thought, well, I'm going to just start with the father. And, and I actually looked at both of them at the same time, and it was about a year and a half or two years into my five years of research for Family of Secrets that I began finding some very interesting things about the father. And interestingly enough, what I'm going to tell you here, and I, you, somebody has to remind me when I'm going on too long because uh, this is quite an involved story, and I want to leave a lot of time for a dialogue here. Uh, so, so perhaps maybe after about another 15 minutes on the book, you can, uh, somebody can signal me. Uh, but in any case... Uh, as I began looking at the father, I discovered all of these secrets. This is why the book, it's not called Family Secrets, it's called Family of Secrets. It is not normal family secrets, it's that, it's that they have so many of them, and that the family itself is a giant secret. And what's so interesting to me is that here we are, this is the best known, arguably best known family perhaps in the world, and it turns out we know nothing about them. If you've read Family of Secrets, you know that almost everything in there is new. It's never been reported before. It's not in any other book. Uh, most of the people in the media have no idea of any of this, and I knew of none of it when I began doing the reporting. Um, but what I found, in short, was that the way I understood American history and the way I understood how power worked and how the presidency worked and how democracy itself functioned was way off. And basically what I learned, and I'll just cut to the chase here and then I'll go back and give you some detail, was that when we make fun of other countries as being banana republics, we make a very, very big mistake because we don't see the extent to which this country is a banana republic. Uh, and that's not hyperbole, as, as you shall soon hear. Uh, basically, um, as I looked at the Bush family, I was interested in how George H.W. Bush got to the top. And most people point to him being CIA director. So my question was, why? Why was he CIA director? Well, nobody could give me an answer. They said, uh, I don't know. Uh, he was brought in. I looked at the clips from the New York Times and what have you, and they basically all shrugged their shoulders, as they do now when uh, General Petraeus is transferred over and made head of the CIA. Why is a general made the head of the CIA? Why, is, why was Leon Panetta the head of the CIA, a man who was a congressman who seemed to have no background really in those things? And then he was shifted over. Now he's running the Pentagon. Again, another area he doesn't seem to be the right person for that. We don't understand anything really of how our government works, and we don't ask the questions. So I thought, why was George H.W. Bush, uh, uh, why was he CIA director? And the answer was because he had no experience. You see, in the mid-1970s, 
Capitol Hill was aflame. You may, some of you may remember the church committee hearings, the Pike committee hearings. Uh, evidence had come out that the CIA was badly out of control, uh, not functioning correctly for an institution of democracy, involved in all manner of illegal, unethical, and untoward uh, 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 activities, both in the United States and abroad, including assassinations that were not authorized, uh, and experimentation on the American people involving drugs and other things. And so uh, Congress said, this is really, really a problem. We need to get into this. And right at the time that they were investigating it, of all the people that the CIA could have chosen, uh, or President Ford could have chosen to, to, to represent the agency, they chose George H.W. Bush. And that seemed so strange to me. And I thought, why would you put him in there if he, was, he had no experience? And basically what I found was he did have experience. He'd had a lot of experience. It was just that we didn't know about it and we weren't supposed to know about it. He had been involved in intelligence or intelligence-related activities, not just that year, but a year before, two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, his entire adult life, he had been in intelligence work. What we really had when he became president of the United States, we had a parallel to the, uh, Russia when they had Putin coming in, except the difference was with Putin, it was open that he'd been a lifelong KGB officer. We had no idea that George H.W. Bush had been tantamount to a lifelong CIA officer. And that already raises questions about the stability of the democracy and the vigorousness of our methods of vetting uh, our leaders. So I became further interested in him. And then I wanted to know, well, let's see, he was CIA director. What did he do before that? Uh, well, what I found was that he had this oil company, Zapata Offshore, and if you're interested in these things, again, there are a whole entire chapters, sometimes several, on each of these matters in Family of Secrets. Uh, is Zapata Offshore was a strange company. When I looked through their records, they never seemed to turn a profit, uh, and yet he was traveling like crazy all over the world. They only had a few rigs, very, very small company, but he, he moved around like he was the head of, uh, of a giant multinational, and he was traveling to all these countries where there was no oil, there was no offshore situation, and there didn't seem to be any clients. And uh, I quickly realized a pattern of where he was going, uh, which I then essentially confirmed with seeing that they had placed one of their rigs off of Cuba uh, prior to the Bay of Pigs invasion, and, and they put uh, Cuban exiles on there. Um, so that was clear to me that he was involved in those things. And then I became interested in, in, in two different directions. In 1963, he apparently, and I read this in another book, this is what got me interested, he had been asked, in an interview, what he remembered about major events like the time that, or the day that John F. Kennedy was killed. Uh, he was asked very benignly, what do you remember about that day? Where were you when you heard that Kennedy was shot? And what do you remember? And he claimed he could not recall. And I always ask audiences, and I guess I won't skip here, how many of you were five years old or over on November 22, 1963? Of those of you who raised your hand, how many of you do not remember where you were when you heard that the president had been shot? And it's okay that you don't remember. I, I won't uh, hold that against you. Anybody? Nobody. Not a single person. Okay. This happens to me at every event. There was one person at one event, and she didn't remember, but she also didn't seem to realize that she was at a talk by me. So that was different. But... Um, this is interesting. And so I was intrigued by that. And then I thought, why? Why would you not remember? And moreover, where, and here's where the who, what, where accident comes in, where was he? So I began trying to figure that out. And this took several years. And this took me into the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I can tell you, and I'm sure Mark will confirm this, any sane journalist knows, just stay away from that stuff. Am I right about that? It's, it's, it's quicksand. It's just deadly. These, these certain subjects, 9-11 is another one. Almost all working journalists stay away from these subjects because they're very, very big. They're extremely explosive. People have very, very uh, strong uh, views and theories on these things, and you just you can't win, basically, and it's just not good. It's a career killer. So I uh, was inclined never to get into that. I didn't really have any position on it, but I felt I needed to at least establish where George H.W. Bush was, and this took me years. Family of Secrets has four or five chapters of all new information on the assassination of John F. Kennedy, something I now feel knowledgeable about, and I no longer uh, am open to the idea that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald 
acted alone or even that he did it. In fact, I know much more about that, and I'm hoping uh, that maybe there will be some future articles or, or books in going further with this. But in Family of Secrets, we go quite far uh, in positioning Mr. Bush with a group of, of CIA uh, officers who were all in Dallas that day and who worked very, very hard to hide that fact. Um, and just to give you a couple of quick examples, um, we found two declassified FBI documents. Now, you have to understand the FBI and the CIA are always in a mortal power struggle. This is very seldom, if ever, reported by the media, but these, these agencies and departments are all fighting with each other, and there are factions within them fighting with each other. Um, basically, J. Edgar Hoover, I believe, was concerned it would come out that the agency knew Lee Harvey Oswald, that the Bureau knew Lee Harvey Oswald, just as the CIA also knew Lee Harvey Oswald, just as other branches of government all knew him in different contexts. And even if they had nothing to do with the assassination, of course, if it came out that they knew him or were giving him some kind of a paycheck, this would be a problem. So I think Hoover was smart enough to put some of this information into these memos he knew would eventually see the light of day. One of them is a memo from November 23, 1963. It's a phone call at 1.45 p.m. to the uh, Houston office of the FBI. Keep in mind the shootings in Dallas. Normally, if you had information, you would call the Dallas office. This call comes into Houston, and it's from a man identifying himself as George H.W. Bush. He gives his home address. He says, I am the president of Zapata Offshore. And he said, I've heard some scuttlebutt. I don't know much about this. I heard the president was shot. I may have a lead on who did it. Now, keep in mind, this is the same man who will later claim he doesn't remember where he was. So he called, and he said, I'd like you to keep this private. I do not want this to be made public. But there is a fellow in Houston I've heard was saying some things about the president, and I think you ought to look into that. Well, I looked into that, and I found a whole chapter in Family of Secrets just on this particular point that uh, he actually knew this man much better than he let on, and not only did he know him, but he knew that he couldn't possibly have been a threat to Kennedy, and furthermore, he knew where he was at the time of the shooting because Mr. Bush's own assistant, Mr. Bush was the chairman of the Harris County Republican Party at the time, uh, his own assistant was at the home of this man asking him if he could paint some lawn signs, and so when it came time for the man to be interviewed by the Secret Service instead of the Secret Service coming and grabbing this suspect, uh, Mr. Bush's assistant drove the man, I, I kid you not, to the Secret Service offices and helped clear him. So this was what I would best describe as an alibi circle. In other words, Mr. Bush was using the other man as an alibi for him, and the other man was using Mr. Bush's assistant as an alibi, and everybody was okay. Now, what was Mr. Bush up to with that phone call? Uh, my, my conclusion, after looking carefully at that, was that the only purpose of that phone call was to state that he was making that call at that time and that he was in this place called Tyler, Texas. Uh, the implication being, I'm calling you from Tyler, Texas. I am not calling you from Dallas. And we don't have time here to go into much more than that, but his wife, Barbara, a lovely, lovely person, uh, years later would publish her own account of where they were in a book after these documents were declassified. Uh, she clearly knows something about this or at least was utilized for the purpose of further obfuscating uh, uh, this particular episode. There's another memo, and this one is, uh, actually relates to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to November 23rd, the day after the shooting. It is a memo from Hoover, and it says that, they, they, the, the, kid you not, the subject line on the uh, on the memo is assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, if Hoover was trying to get our attention, he certainly did it with that one. And he said, the State Department asked us to uh, see whether Cuban exiles might be up to no good seeing Kennedy's assassination as an invitation to go ahead and launch their own invasion of Cuba. We checked it out, and there's nothing to it. The whole memo looks a little dubious to me, but it says uh, we, sh we briefed representatives of two other intelligence agencies on this matter, Mr. William Edwards of the D Defense Intelligence Agency and Mr. George Bush of the CIA. And so I believe that was Hoover saying, you want to play, uh, you want to play checkmate here? Here we go. Okay, so there's that document. Uh, there's much, much more. I hope you'll pick up a copy of Family of Secrets. It's very important, uh, not just to the author, but also to support local independent bookstores, bookstores like Point Reyes Books, where you can come in and you can talk to the owners and you can actually browse through books and uh, meet your, meet your uh, neighbors and, and compare notes. This is a, a priceless experience that can never be rec recreated in any uh, digital form that's at least currently available. Um, so anyway... 
I became very interested in that. And then I thought, all right, now let's move forward in Mr. Bush's life. And I wanted to trace him to the presidency. And I realized that before he was CIA director, the reason he got on the national radar was because Richard Nixon uh, went to great lengths to help him. And I thought that was strange because if you've read any of the uh, authorized, <laughs> semi-authorized, famous biographies of Richard Nixon, they always paint him as this eccentric, difficult man who hated everybody and trusted no one. Well, he, was, he supposedly fired, what, his whole cabinet practically. So here is George H.W. Bush is the only one he's helping out and he's promoting him all the time. And I was so fascinated by that. I thought, there's got to be something there. And I thought, where does this relationship between Bush and Nixon begin? Well, it took me all the way back from 19... 1968 back to 1946 and I remember somebody was working with me on the book and he said oh god now you're going to tell me that all those hundreds of books on Nixon missed the basic story and I said yeah I'm afraid so and he said oh man and what I found was that Richard Nixon had again a kind of a secret life he he had uh, you remember he always railed against the Eastern establishment and it complained about that. We always thought he was talking about liberals, but he wasn't. He was talking about bankers. And Richard Nixon had been created as a politician in 1946 by a group of Eastern bankers, uh, one in particular, a man by the name of Prescott Bush. This is the grandfather of George W., the father of George H.W., a banker with the powerful investment bank banking firm of Brown Brothers Harriman. And uh, there was a congressman from L.A. by the name of Jerry Voorhees. And he was holding hearings in the aftermath of the Great Depression about all of these derivative-like derivative products and how Wall Street was out of control and was destroying basically uh, the, for the, 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 uh, the well financial well-being of ordinary Americans. And so he was holding these hearings and he was determined to get to the bottom of this and create new regulations. And the bankers wanted this dangerous man out. And so they sent Prescott Bush to Whittier, California, uh, where he then drafted Richard Nixon. And he owned Richard Nixon for many, many years. And usually I have a copy of Family of Secrets up here, and I show you a picture. It's a picture of two men wearing Panama hats. And uh, uh, one is a young Richard Nixon. He's already vice president, moved up very, very rapidly. The other is a taller man uh, who is toying with Nixon's hat. Nixon looks embarrassed. Not that pleased with this, but he can't do anything about it. And the older man looks like, hey, I'll play with your hat if I want to. And that older man is now Senator Prescott Bush. In any case, uh, I'm just going to wrap that up. But, but in, in, what I found was that, that Nixon was essentially a servant of all of these special interests until he became president of the United States, at which point he tried to break away from them. And he began doing things on his own. And that is why he got together with Henry Kissinger and began secret diplomacy. The secret diplomacy was not secret from the Chinese or the Soviets. It was not secret from any of those people. It was only secret from his own people. And he had to keep it secret from them because they wouldn't have wanted him to do that. And it turned out that in an uh, eerie parallel, he faced the exact same group of people and the same problems that John F. Kennedy faced, namely that the military-industrial complex that General Dwight Eisenhower warned us about uh, was not happy with a president doing what they wanted. And now this gives you some very useful context for understanding Barack Obama and why he keeps Robert Gates and why he has five wars going and why he can't seem to break away from this. Uh, it is because he can't break away from this. None of them can. And bad things happen to those who do. Uh, and so that is, I think, the real value of doing this kind of historical reporting after we all want to kind of move away from the Bushes and not hear another word about them. We had great trouble when Family of Secrets came out getting anybody to pay any attention. People said, I don't want to hear another word. I don't want you on my show. I don't, I don't want to read the book, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally now, thanks to... Uh, Ordinary Americans, it has become a kind of a sleeper bestseller. It has sold very, very well. We finally gotten it's coming out as an audio book. It came out in, in, as an electronic book, and best of all, you can again pick it up in your local bookstore. Uh, but it is just now really getting its its uh, its land legs. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to start wrapping all of that up. Uh, the second half of the book is about George W. Bush, who turns about to be turns out to be much more interesting and much smarter than we realize. That much of that uh, portraying him as a fool was deliberate because it cut him a lot of slack and all he had to do was show up at the debate and not stumble and people said that he had won and this was brilliant they were very very good at this there's a quote in the book where he tells one of his advisors you know what the trick is the media are so foolish that all you have to do is decide that there's a story you want them to publish and you bury it in plain sight and then they find it and they think they got something great here 
And of course, it's never anything really, really embarrassing. It's only something that humanizes him. So for example, all that stuff about his drinking, that helped him. Do you realize that? That helped him politically because most people drink. And most people, a lot of people may have a problem with drinking and they see that as a human touch as opposed to John Kerry who was portrayed as an elitist who didn't share the, the ordinary touch. So they were able to use that. They were able to use his born again thing to erase his entire life before then. So people could not even look at what he had done before because it didn't matter because he was born again. And then he picked up a cool 20, 30 million Americans who consider themselves to be uh, evangelical Christians. We actually have in Family of Secrets documents from his advisor on religious things who essentially told me that he was the one who convinced the Bush family that if they did not demonstrate sufficiently that they were in that camp, they could not possibly be elected to the White House because there just weren't enough votes without this evangelical bloc. George H.W. Bush was like, I, I really can't pull this thing off. And George W. apparently was like, hey, I can do that because he was a good he was a very, very good actor. Um, anyway, there's a lot more about him. There's a lot more about uh, what happened to Dan Rather. That's a very interesting and important story that is poorly understood. Uh, I'll just a hint there will be covert operations. Uh, there are a lot of people whose job is to create false documents and to smear people and to release things and to leak things and so forth. Uh, and, and Dan Rather had become, and his, his organization had become a problem for the prevailing uh, um, um, power centers, shall we say, and it was very, very easy to take them out. And I would encourage you to start thinking about all of your favorite people who were on their way up to the top who suddenly had an unfortunate honeypot scandal or something went awry and suddenly uh, they were out of the running. Almost all of the populist candidates who really had strong poll ratings, something happened to them and they never made it to the uh, nominating convention. Now, some of those are accidents. I'm not saying uh, that they're not, but uh, you can't have that many accidents that are that consistent uh, pattern-wise. And I've talked to statisticians about this, and they, they agree. Anyway, uh, now that I have thoroughly depressed you all, <laughs> let me just uh, move this towards some, some, some ideas about what we can do about all of it. First of all, it has become increasingly clear to me that... Uh, that uh, we live in a country where very few people have almost everything, and the rest of us have very little. And that that is more futile than it is democratic, that there's something wrong with that. When you work all your life and you are told, put your money in these stocks, uh, you know, buy a house, that, that's secure, you can't lose your house, uh, uh, put your money into a, a you know, retirement account, uh, uh, you get a pension, all of this is secure, and then you find out, all bets are off. Something is really, really wrong because those guys at the top, they never end up in serious trouble. Nobody ever goes to jail. Nobody ever suffers. None of those people gave up their giant houses, their multiple vehicles and boats and everything else, and they're still doing just fine. Thank you very much. So how do you do that? How do you keep yourself on top and gaming the system all the time and everybody else on the bottom? Well, in, in a totalitarian society, you do it by force of arms. How do you do it in a democracy? There's only one way to do it, and that is to make sure that the people cannot figure out what is going on. And this is where almost all the effort goes into. This is, explains Fox News. This explains all of these ridiculous candidates who are not serious to begin with. But you see, they, di they divert us. When we spend all our time complaining about the, 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 the Bachmans and the Herman Keynes and so on, we use precious time that could be used to figure out how things really do work and to begin reforming the system. Um, I would actually criticize even your favorite, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, TV shows on, on cable that, that you enjoy because they are constantly going after these purportedly bad people because they are filling up all the time with that and they have zero analysis of the type that I'm telling you about. Uh, I was unable to get on any of those shows, and I mean any of those shows. Even you could name whatever you want and they would not have me on because they felt that this material was just too hot uh, and they didn't know how to handle it. Uh, we had this with major newspapers that at the last minute decided not to review the book. They did not criticize it. One, one wrote a kind of a ridiculous critique, but, but uh, others were positive. But most of them wouldn't touch it because they just didn't know how to handle this material. But we've got to get past that, and we've got to talk openly about the problems with our democracy or, or lack thereof. Um, and we also have to, we have to see and we have to focus. We have limited time. All of us have uh, families and work and hobbies and getting by 
I and, and our own causes that are very important to us and are all, such as uh, the commons movement, which I, which I uh, adore and which is extremely important uh, and, and which I know is very, very important here in Marin, uh, West Marin. These are extremely important, but we also have to find a little bit of time for this big macro picture. It is because we can never find any time that we can't do anything about this. And so um, our objectives with my book, Family of Secrets, and with our nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan investigative news website, whowhatwhy.com, is to begin exploring all these stories. We looked into Libya. We wanted to know, was that really for humanitarian reasons that they went in there and bombed the heck out of that country? And if so, why did they not do that in other countries where many more people were dying? You can read that on Who, What, Why, and we uh, did enough research to find out that, no, sadly, the reason they went into Libya was because... um, Various uh, different countries had their own agendas. France was the first one that wanted to go in there. Uh, A part of it had to do with toppling the Italians. They are friends and neighbors who had the inside track on the sweet crude oil there. Uh, And they were approached by some people from Gaddafi's inner circle who said, it's possible to take him out. How would you like to be in the driver's seat? And they liked that. Uh, Merci beaucoup. Uh, So the U.S. had its own motives in going in there, which had a lot to do with losing bases elsewhere and needing bases to protect the Saudi oil fields. Uh, Libya was in a perfect spot for that. And so these are the kind of things you're not hearing on your evening news. You're not reading this, by the way, in your uh, liberal, progressive uh, magazines of opinion either. They, won't, they, for some reason, won't touch any of this. Um, Osama bin Laden, whatever you think of that raid, there are questions about that. We did a piece at whowhatwhy.com where we looked at the New Yorker did the, uh, any of you read the New Yorker, they did what was supposed to be the official version of what happened. Well, first, the reporter at the Washington Post discovered that it, when you're reading this TikTok and the thoughts of all the Navy SEALs, that uh, actually the reporter never interviewed any of them, never spoke to anyone who was an eyewitness. He got the story second or third hand and then hid that fact. We then went further and we dissected the entire article, trying to figure out who the sources were. I think we figured it out. Uh, and I can, I can say with some certainty that there's something else going on there. We don't know exactly what it is. It could, not, it could be something somewhere in the middle. It could be slightly benign. But all this stuff about what happened to them and then the, the crash with the other members of the same Navy, Navy SEAL unit, you remember that, some weeks later in Afghanistan, they all died. Supposedly nobody died when the helicopter crashed in the compound in Abbottabad. It's all very, very strange. This is the kind of work that journalists are supposed to be doing. And as we come out with these stories, we just did another one the other day about um, about um, uh, the Saudis and 9-11. Now, we've never touched 9-11, but I don't know if you've heard the story. The Miami Herald reported that a Saudi family left their house in Sarasota, Florida, 11 days before 9-11, and left all their possessions behind, all their cars, brand new car in the driveway, dirty diapers, fruit on the table, and they disappeared. Literally, it seemed like they had maybe minutes to leave their house. And uh, we are told that an FBI investigation connected that house to phone numbers and calls to 11 of the hijackers, that Mohammed Atta and another one of his alleged co-conspirators uh, were identified at the gate of this uh, gated community. Um, you can make what you will of this, but obviously that's a story that should be reported and discussed. The Miami Herald story, there, a mainstream newspaper, was ignored by all of the rest of the press, whether it's your favorite uh, liberal left publication or your favorite conservative news program. Not a one of them covered it, as far as I know. I don't think the wire services really covered it. Uh, and then we did the second half of the story. We at whowhatwhy.com, we investigated that family, and we found that the man who owned that house and whose daughter and son-in-law lived there is the, uh, he and his his brother are the top executives of one of the largest companies in Saudi Arabia that is owned by one of the Saudi royal princes. And we found out that the Saudi royal prince himself trained to be a pilot in South Florida some years ago, that he is in charge of the international airports in Saudi Arabia, uh, and many, many other interesting things, including that his brother, uh, who was living in Kentucky and breeding uh, the the horse that won the uh, Kentucky Derby in 2000, that the brother uh, uh, was one of those people who were rushed out of the country. Remember that? They put them all on planes and let them all go out without the FBI interviewing him. That the brother, and that the brother had been identified by an al-Qaeda operative in, 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 uh, in interrogation as his contact, and he gave the man's 
home number and his cell phone number. Now, again, this may all mean nothing. This may all have been concocted to send us in the wrong direction, but it does seem that the, some of the basics with the house are true. We reported that story. We put it out. People all over the internet are, are forwarding it to other people, but if you haven't heard that, that's because none of your favorite news outlets will cover this at all. We even brought in a big PR person who was a former BBC reporter. She put it out through her company to every major outlet, including 48 people at Al Jazeera, and as far as I know, none of these news organizations will report this at all. So there we are. So what do we do about it? We use the internet. We use our Twitter. We use our Facebook. We use our email list. We now are empowered. We don't need them anymore. If each of you gets out there and shares your personal experience here this evening with some other people you know, when you go to Thanksgiving or whatever you go to uh, and you, uh, uh, you are with people, your relatives, your friends, your enemies, whatever they are, tell them about some of this stuff. And we are discovering, because who, what, why is not partisan, that we've got people all over the political spectrum coming and reading this stuff. I get emails every day from people who say, I am retired Colonel so-and-so, I'm a rock-ribbed conservative Republican, and I love your site. You are giving us facts, and we appreciate that. Uh, we have libertarians coming to the site. We have people who have no uh, political affiliation. We have 19-year-olds, and we have 90-year-olds. We have people coming. We can see them coming onto the site from Zambia and Saudi Arabia and China and Ecuador and, and on and on and on. The West Virginia, everywhere, they're coming to the site. Uh, and they're interested. And so we know that if, with your support, if we can grow this, we can begin redirecting people's attention so that we uh, stop being deluded about what is going on uh, and begin focusing on the solutions. Now, people say, well, why don't you propose solutions? But I don't need to do that because you all have the solutions. You know what they are. Get off of oil, get onto alternative uh, systems, uh, better methods of farming, organics, uh, peace, not war. I mean, you know, elect people who uh, really care and have the right values, get money out of politics. The solutions are all there. That's not the problem. The problem is that people don't understand how serious the structural deficiencies are uh, and have not really wakened themselves to act actually do anything. You see the small group of people there on Wall Street uh, protesting. It's a fairly small group. The rest of us are not doing that. We all need to step up to the challenge because there really isn't a whole lot of time left, but there is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous upside for us to take our country uh, and our world back. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.